Well, it's great, great to be here today. With lots of things uh, to talk about. And uh, autism got brought up, so I might want to explain that just a little bit. Autism ranges from Einstein, half Silicon Valley, the best horse trainers that possibly could be, to somebody who can't dress themselves. Uh, and it's kind of a behavioral profile. A lot of famous people have um, autism. People like Steve Jobs, Einstein, and what we gotta do with those kids that are different is build on the thing that they are good at. It might be art, music, mathematics, whatever it is. Build on that strength. It's one of the things that you need to do. We wouldn't even have electronics the other day if it wasn't for some autism. <laughs> okay, let's get done started talking about visual thinking. How many people recognize what that is right there? Those are eclipse shadows. That's on a sidewalk on our campus during a 95% eclipse. And the tree acted like little pinhole cameras. That's why you can see little tiny eclipses. Now, I didn't know eclipses did this. I noticed these weird shadows. And this occurred right when the classes were changing. Hundreds of students walking over this, and they didn't see it. And being a visual thinker helped me in my work with, uh, with animals. And when I first started out, I thought everybody was a visual thinker. I didn't realize my thinking was different. Then you got some people that are mathematical thinkers. They're the ones that are gonna do computers, programming, and a lot of those kinds of things. Well, a calm animal, whether it's a steer or whether it's a horse, is a much easier animal to handle. Let's say the cattle got excited when they brought them in, give them half an hour to calm down. If the horse is having a bad time at the vet clinic, maybe put him in the stall, let him calm down for 20 or 30 minutes. Now when animals get scared, it's due to fear. They get scared. And one of the big mistakes people make with animals when they're acting badly is they think it's aggression. Now, if the bull comes after you on the pasture, yeah, that's aggression. <laughs> that is aggression. But if an animal's jumping all around in the squeeze chute, that's probably due to fear. Now, here's an example of a horse definitely gets some fear. The saddle is falling off, and this is not photoshopped. This picture's real. I think the cowboy's pride got hurt, but the horse is scared because what happened when that saddle fell off, it's sudden novelty. You know, a lot of people here show animals and they'll say, oh, my horse or my steer, he was fine at home and he went berserk at the show. And the reason for that is there's lots of new things at the show, like flags, bikes, and balloons. And flags and bikes are scary because they do a lot of rapid movement. Even something like this tent moving, it was really, really windy, that could upset an animal. So it's really important before your animal goes to a show to get him accustomed to strange people touching him, because that's gonna happen, steer judging, get him used to things like baby strollers, flags, bikes, balloons, and let your animal walk up to these things. Don't shove it in the animal's face. Maybe decorate the pasture with flags, let the cattle or the horses walk up to it. Because new things are attractive if they can voluntarily approach. Now this is where you're gonna get an interaction with genetics. You can have an animal that's got flighty genetics. And when you suddenly introduce the novelty, boy, that's when you'll see the genetics. Now, what are some signs that cattle and horses are starting to get upset? First thing, heads up, nostrils flaring, ears pinned back. And when they start pooping, it's because you scared the poop out of them. <laughs> that's a tail switching in horses. That's your warning right before he bucks, especially if there's no flies on him. And that tail starts switching more and more and more and then he bucks you off or the steer kicks. Eye white showing, your animal is really upset. Sort of like a pot coming to a boil. And this is one of the reasons why in training horses you want to keep training sessions short. You get them too long, you can see the horse kind of heating up. You want to stop the training session before he bucks. You watch that tail switching. Yep, it's a good time to end it on a good note. Now, the first work I ever did with livestock is I noticed what cattle were seeing when they went through a chute. And right in this situation, the animals are going into the blinding sun. Don't want to go. They might change the time of day. I see somebody nodding there. They've had that happen on their ranch. 
I'd strongly recommend not facing a cattle handling facility straight east. Might want to change the time of day that you handle them. Now, animals will go from a darker place to a brighter place, but they're not going to go into blinding sun. Get down in the chute and see what they're seeing. Now, right here, they can see a car through the fence. Vehicles parked alongside the fences. They often cause a lot of problems because you can get a lot of reflections off of vehicles that you don't have off of other things. There's a little white jug there that was hanging there and just kind of moving. Little piece of red string. And I get asked all the time, since I work with the slaughter plants, the cattle know they're going to get slaughtered. And I found they behave the same way at the slaughter plant as they do on a ranch. You know, they get kind of, you know, they get stressed in either place. Chains hanging down in chutes. I noticed this would make cattle stop. Get these distractions out of your facilities. And animals will show you the thing they don't like. They'll stop and look right at it. Give them a chance to look at it. But better, just get the chains out of there. This is what I call the dark movie theater effect. Real sunny outside, and they don't want to go into the building. Now, a lot of the facilities here have open sides on a building, so you're going to have less problems with this. They can see through the building, they'll go in. Now, at night, you can light that up with lights, and they'll go right in. You can use lighting, artificial lighting at night, to attract them into that. Or you put in some panels so they can see through it, see light through it. Right here, we've got a, a leader animal there stopping at a puddle. Give your lead animal the opportunity to put its head down and take a look. If you push it when the head is up, it, when the head's up or down, it won't go. When the head's down, let it look. When the head comes back up, then you can push it. Ron Gill at Texas A&M says, head up, no go. Head down, no go. Okay, wait for them to get neutral, then you can push them. Backstop gates. They often cause a lot of blocking. You might want to put a remote control rope on it. Now, one thing that's good on this backstop gate is the hinge is high enough that they're not going to bump their back. The animal thinks he's going to bump his back here. He's not going to want to go in. Moving small groups, I can't emphasize how important this is. You're working in your corrals, bring small groups up to the crowd pen that leaves the single file. You know, maybe it's only three or four animals. You need to figure out what works in your facility. And if four animals works really well, then it's four animals, not six or seven animals. Good handling is going to require a lot more walking. <laughs> and we have problems with that in many, many different places. Fill the crowd pen that leads to your single file shoot half full. Cannot emphasize that enough. Do not jam it full. Do not push the gate upside on. Now what I want to show you here is the flight zone. You can see the shape. There's kind of like a bubble around the people. Now if you have completely tame show steer, those you have to leave. Put a halter on them, lead them, lead them with a bucket of feet. And if you've got super tame cattle and they're pushing and shoving on you, don't put the feet out until they stop pushing and shoving. Because if you put the feet down, or the horse too, horse is pulling like this and you put the feet down, now you've rewarded this behavior. Wait until they stop, then you put the feed down. You do not want to reward, accidentally reward bad manners and animals. But you can sort of see this force field. And most cattle are not completely tame. And right here, you can see cattle circling around the person. So just remember, I showed you this bubble. We go back to that. Okay, now you look at this. They're going out the gate and they're just circling around the edge of the bubble. And you get yourself in just the right position. They'll just flow out the gate. Now this shows the two parts of the flight zone. The dotted line shows a single file a shoot. And the big mistake that I see people make all the time is they stand at the head of the animal and poke the butt. I don't know how many times I see people doing that that does not work. You want it to go forward in the shoot get behind the point of balance of the shoulder. Do not stand in front of it and take a stick or a paddle and poke its butt. Now there's two kind of zones. There's a flight zone, like I showed that bubble. But then there's a zone where the animal knows you're there. Ron Gill has also talked about cattle want to see you. Now when you enter the flight zone, they move away. But when you see that tan animal 
he's turning and looking. He knows that I'm there. So there's two zones. There's the flight zone, and then the zone where they know you're there. And they'll turn around and they'll look at you. And another thing you want to do is pressure and release. You get them going where you want them to go, then back off. You reward them. Doing what you want them to do. Now this is kind of handy dandy little thing. That's really counterintuitive. What you do is you quickly step forward, walk back in the opposite direction. Walk back by them in the opposite direction. And when you cross the shoulder, they'll go forward. It sometimes works a whole lot better than just trying to pat them on the butt. Try it. It works. All of these diagrams are in my books. They're also on my website, grandon.com. Just my last name, grandon.com. And I even have some Spanish language versions. Now, this particular facility has an outer solid fence. Really important to block guys seeing cars and other things. So if you have a facility where they can see you through the fence, imagine that that force field comes through that fence. Don't stand there inside the flight zone because then you're going to start to see tails going up, pooping, jumping around. You got to stay outside that force field. And it's going to vary depending upon how much handling your animals have had. But you want to enter that flight zone only when it's time to move them. This shows you why it might be a good idea to put solid fences up because the animals coming up this chute can see the trucks being loaded. In fact, this particular feed yard had two different facilities. One that had an outer fence that was open like this, and the other one that had a solid sides around the outer perimeter, and the one with the solid sides worked better. If the animal rears, back off. This animal is rearing because the person is too close. Back off. Get out of the flight zone. Don't try to shut it down. Just back off. Back off. He's rearing because he's trying to get away from you. Now, how long should I make my single file shoot? You want to make it long enough to get some following behavior. Probably four or five cows. You don't want 20 cows in there getting into trouble. But you want to use that following behavior. You know, wait until you might have one cow in the squeeze chute. Then when you bring the next punch up, they'll just follow and go on in. Now here's one place you might want to try a solid side piece of cardboard. Because you've got to stand up there by the squeeze chute to operate it. So try putting a piece of cardboard on the back half. You've got to use something stiff that doesn't flap. Because if it flaps, they're not going to go in. But just try some cardboard on the back half of that squeeze chute. And there's a study that tried this out in Brazil. The other thing we've got to do is stop yelling and screaming at cattle. Because yelling and screaming has intent. They know you're mad at them. The first step that people have to do is calm down. I want to get rid of all the arm waving and all of this and all the yelling. Because once you get them all upset, it takes half an hour to calm back down. So the secret is don't get them upset in the first place. And if you calm down, when you work with animals, there's a whole lot more things you can learn about stockmanship, but you're not going to learn it until you calm down. Now, there's been some controversy among people working with animals about whether the sides on a chute should be open or they should be closed. When I first started out oh, 44 years ago, that's a long time, cattle were a lot wilder than they were today. We did the first temperament selection 20 years ago. And when we first did this 20 years ago, people thought I was crazy because we found that animals that jumped all around in the squeeze chute had lower weight gain. So for 20 years, we've been doing temperament selection. Boy, I can tell you, some of the wild cattle we had 20 years ago, you needed solid sides. <laughs> but now you get some of the calmer animals, you might not need them. So if you have an open side, you gotta really respect that force field that kind of extends from a solid, the open side. It's gonna require more skill. The most important part of the block is outer perimeters. Now I can hear a lot of traffic here, so loading ramp along the side of the road, I think it might be a really good idea to make it solid. Another problem we've got, big feed yards is employee turnover. Yeah, but I'm gonna cover everything up if I don't have skilled people. This shows some of my traditional curved facilities, and the principle here, the round crowd pen, is that the cattle come on around the bend, they think they're going back to where they come from. Going back to where they come from is a natural behavior that we can use in handling animals. 
Now this shows the right and the wrong way to lay out a, a curved facility. And if you lay it out wrong, the way the dotted line shows it, it's not going to work. Because as an animal comes up to the entrance, it looks like a dead end. It's not going to work. The junction between a single file and the crowd pen, that's the most critical part of the layout. This shows a simpler layout. I've, been, I've, I've done a new book on guide for working with farm animals. I've got a lot of simpler layouts that you can make with portable panels. Saw it on the outside. And instead of having all those catwalks, you, you work at the pivot of the crowd gate. They'll come right on around you. Right on around you. Works just absolutely great, and it's a lot less expensive. And this is another one where, again, you work the pivot of the crowd gate. These layouts are in the book. They're also on Brandon.com. They're free on Brandon.com. And you may have heard about the bud box. Super simple, but more skill dependent. And the way this works, you put the cattle in here, and then you stand in there. You see how they're circling around? Remember I showed you that bubble? They're circling around. And if you use this design, you absolutely must not overload it. If you have super wild cattle, unskilled people, I wouldn't recommend this. Where this makes the most sense is if you have to uh, haul panels around to many, many different pastures. Because flat panels are easier to haul around. This is where this makes sense. But if you got some super wild uh, cattle, I don't think I'd want to use this, especially with unskilled people. And in the bud box layout, super important not to overload it. What you put in there has to fit into the single file shoot because you don't want to have a lone animal left. The lone animal puts a lot of people in the hospital because cattle get upset when they're by themselves. Now how about driving aids? Now where I like to use a little flag is just to turn cattle in the crowd pen. Then I don't have to be in there with them. But the big mistake that people make with driving aids is around here doing this. So there's some people teaching low stress handling they don't want any driving aids because they want to stop the arm waving. But the one place where you want to have one is in the crowd pen. And I had a rancher just talk to me the other day down at the NCBA that he can touch an animal with that driving aid and he's out of kicking range. And that is definitely, yeah, that's definitely true. Okay, electric rods. Get them out of your hand. I'm not going to recommend banning them because I've seen too much tail twisting. I've seen too much uh, hitting of animals with different things. And if an animal refuses to go on the squeeze, it just refuses. Probably one buzz is better than, uh, uh, than hitting it. But get it out of your hand. You shouldn't be using that as your primary driving aid. And then another mistake that was brought up at the NCBA show was, you know, cow doesn't leave the squeeze shoot that promptly. Well, you don't need a buzzer. You'll give her a few seconds to come out. You see, we can make coming into the corrals not, you know, look, you know, nicer. They're going to be more willing to come back there in the future. And what they're doing right now down in Brazil with the Nori cattle is when they come through the squeeze chute, they fade them. That makes it even better. Now, packing plants, I'd recommend making everything completely soft because you've got so much commotion going on there. Now, there's kind of two design concepts. I can make something super simple like the bud box, flat panels. But it requires more stockmanship skill. Or I can make the designs I showed where you work the pivot, a little more expensive, requires less skill. And I came up with those designs, especially for smaller ranches, especially in a lot of parts of the United States right now. There's a lot of cattle on leased land, and you don't really want to donate your cattle handling facilities to the, to the landlord, so you want to use portable equipment. Non-slip flooring, I cannot emphasize how important that is. And if you're using something just a few times a year, that can be dirt. But some of the worst problems I've seen with slippery floors, uh, one animal scales, squeeze shoots, and you get these little rapid slips. And they just freak out doing these little rapid slips. You put a mat in there, you put in some um, little piece of rebar or something welded in there, it's gonna really, really calm them down. And if you're using a hydraulic squeeze chute, you need to make sure that somebody hasn't screwed the pressure relief belt down as tight as it will go. If an animal moves when the pump back bypasses, you've got it way, way, way too tight. If you use a hydraulic chute correctly, it's actually safer than a manual. 
Nice non-slip flooring, double D family mat, and I do not get a commission from them. Now, I want to ask you, raise your hand if you saw that that animal was looking at the sunbeam. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're doing better here. Mm -hmm. You know what I find? The students do better than the grown-ups. And when I show this slide to elementary school kids, half the hands go up. Yeah. Because elementary school kids have got more visual thinking. Now this is animal handling scoring. Beef quality assurance, animal handling scoring. This is a system I worked on developing. We first developed it for meat packing plants. And the thing about measuring handling is if you measure it, then I can tell am I getting better? Or is my prod score going up? Or my vocalization score going up? Or my falling score getting worse? Is it getting better? These are really good figures to be proud of. My former student, Ruth Wollywoody, went around to uh, a whole bunch of feed yards in Nebraska, Kansas, and Colorado, and the prod score was 5% of the cap. It used to be 500%. Handling is one of the places where things have really improved. Vocalization from getting banged by the head gate or electric prods at about 1%, <laughs> falling under 1% really good. You got a lot of rough handling, you might have 10, 15 percent of your cattle fall. That's terrible. Stumbling, uh, getting caught around the head or around the waist, you know, that should be 2 percent or less. But you measure these outcomes. I'm not telling you, it doesn't tell you how to build facilities. What we're doing here is we're measuring outcomes. Now this is the original tournament uh, data from 20 years ago. And we found that the berserk animals that rated a 4 gained less weight. And this has been replicated. Also, there's a number of other studies. Animals that run fast out of squeeze shoots, they also gain less weight. Now, there are emotional systems in the animal's brain. We already talked about fear. Another one's uh, anger. That's when the mom and cow comes after you and messing with her calf. Mm -hmm. Then you have separation distress. You take the calf away from the mother and they're getting really upset. That's not fear, that's separation distress. That's actually a different behavior trait than fear is. Now, each one of these traits has a genetic component, but there's also a lot of learning. Then you have seek. Like, for example, one Labrador retriever, all it wants to do is chase the ball. Another Labrador retriever makes a great service dog because it's kind of lazy. <laughs> and in cattle, you can have some animals that will go out and eat a lot of pasture, and other lazy cattle lay around the water hole. And then, of course, you got sex. You got the mother young nurturing behavior, licking. You probably had cows with you. They defend the calf, but they don't bother to lick it. And then you've got play. And you can have high and low fear cows. And then this is a study from New Mexico State University. You got a high seek cow that go get her. They actually call it a go get her. Goes out and gets lots of pasture. Verified with GPS. Or you can have laid back, lays around the water too lazy to go out and graze. <laughs> One thing I want to tell you is don't overselect for any trait. You overselect for temperament, you know, you might get a cow that's so lazy it doesn't do anything, it might take care of its calf. Right now, I think we're having some problems with overselecting for meat traits. We're starting to get some bad things. Leg conformation issues, mm -hmm. you overselect for an appearance trait, a production trait, like lots of meat, or a performance trait like a fast racehorse, you overselect for any trait you wreck your animal, period. Well, I just found out a very disturbing thing is starting to happen in the feed yards. It used to be that if you properly precondition cattle, get them all vaccinated 45 days before you ship them, they wouldn't get sick at the feed yards. Well, what's happening now is they do great in receiving. 60 or 70 days out, they're getting shipping fever or BRD. Hmm. What's happening? We've bred them so much for meat, they're losing immunity. Kind of need to look at an animal like a country, and you have a national budget. And if you put the whole national budget into the economy, that'd be making meat. You have nothing left for military. We have problems now with uh, dairy cattle that won't breed. See, what we've got to start looking at is what is optimal. And I just learned this from a nutritionist at NCBA. He was telling about the southern section of animal science about this late stage BRD. Another problem we've got is cattle dying of heart attacks, like two weeks before they were gonna get slaughtered. Yeah, those cattle have zero weight gain. It's not gonna make the closeouts look very good. 
when you've got a thousand pounds of zero weight gain, not good at all. You know, 20 years ago, we didn't have animals to have late stage deaths. This is an example of what I call bad becoming normal. Mm -hmm. Creeps up on you and you don't realize it. Well, then you've got the purebred Roman. You treat them right, they treat you right, and they like to be stroked. Mm -hmm. This brings up another thing. Don't patch a horse like this, stroke it, stroke it. And then scratch it here when you're riding. That's where the mare does it. Do it like the mother, because the study shows that calms it down. Now what this chart's basically telling you is when you force animals to do things, you get a lot more fear stress compared to animals voluntarily cooperate. Animals voluntarily cooperate, you don't get all the fear stress. An animal's first experience when your horse first goes in a horse trailer, you bring an animal to a new place, it meets a new person. Let's make sure that first experiences are good first experiences. Also, animals can get fear memories. Like you train a horse to tolerate a blue and white umbrella, that doesn't transfer to a tarp. Umbrellas and tarps look totally different. This is why before you take your horse or your steer to a show, you need to get them used to a whole lot of different things. And there's research now that shows very clearly good stockmanship pace, both new studies and old studies. And you move cattle frequently, quietly, they tame down. And we need to make sure when we switch pastures, they walk by you in a single file line and they don't run to the next pasture and ditch the baby cats. That's not something you want them doing. Now the thing about something novel, put some expensive camera equipment out in the pasture, they're going to come up to it. Novelty is both scary and attractive. There's a cool video you can look up. Go online and type in video cattle remote controlled car. Now when the remote controlled car first goes in the pasture, they run from it. But then they start to chase it. It's the funniest thing you ever saw. Okay, I'm going to have to watch that now. Animal memories are specific. For example, the animals get used to somebody feeding them out of a truck. Person gets out of the truck, they run away. Person in the truck, person on the ground. See, it's a different picture because they're thinking sensory based. You want to understand any animal, it's sensory based. Get away from words. They remember sounds, smells, visual things. Think about it. Tarts and umbrellas look totally different. Now I was talking to a rancher that had really worked hard on his low stress handling. And he'd go out on his ranch and his cattle were super calm, but they were flighty genetics. And I said to him, I'm gonna bet you those cattle would scatter if a hot air balloon landed on that pasture. And he admitted that that happened and they did scatter. Mm -hmm. No matter how beautifully trained they were, right. that was something so novel that the animal with a flighty temperament showed off its genetics then. Man on a horse, man on the ground. Cattle view that as two different things. And it's really dangerous for cattle to go to a packing plant or a feed yard that haven't learned how to go in and out of pens with a person on foot. Because you can have a situation where you work them on a horse, the flight zone's 10 feet. Then when you put them in a small pen at an auction, the flight, for, the flight zone's now turned to 60 feet, so what happens is you put them in the pen, they come back out and run over the top of you because they're trying to get away from you. Men on a horse, men on the ground. You as two different things. Dogs around the chutes, I hate them. And the question that came up at NCBA, what about dogs in the field? I've seen some good dogs out in the field, but a blue healer around the lead up, she just teaches them to kick. Yeah. Yeah, teach them how to kick with both barrels. And then when they go on down the supply chain, it's super dangerous. Teach them to tolerate different vehicles, different people, all different kinds of things, big trucks, little trucks, four-wheelers. You first introduce a four-wheeler, let's bring it out there and feed them on it, not chase them with it. Now you manage what you measure. We already talked about this some. And measuring things prevents bad from becoming normal. I'm very worried and now I'm very concerned about what I learned at NCBA about this late stage BRD, or what we used to call shipping fever. Mm -hmm. You get them all through receiving, and then they're dead when they're you know, like two months, three months old. That didn't happen before. You know, you can over-select for meat traits, 
and you select the hardiness out. That's not good. Well, they get really big and they're dying shortly before slaughter. We've had problems with uh, cattle coming into meat plants with eroded knee joints. I've done some work with a veterinarian named Scott Crane. He was breaking open knee joints in the plant on fed cattle, and he was sending me pictures of knee joints, and he, um, uh, I, I, I explained him to make a chart out of that. No, they never used to have eroded knee joints before, and there's a big genetic component in this. Okay, our animal handling. How many run when I handle them? How many fall when I handle them? How many stumble coming out of his way shoot? How many move when I catch them? Due to a pride. Obviously, if you brand them, they're going to move. But I should be able to get them out of that chute without having them vocalize. Electric pride, I hope very few have moved with that. Now, there's also differences in different animals and how easy they are to handle. You can measure that. And when I'm seeing a problem now at a meat plant, in fact, I just had breakfast this morning with Bill Fueling, and he used to run, uh, he was, used to be the head of Cargill Beef. And I was explaining to him that we're seeing welfare issues at a slaughterhouse. And all of the issues are caused by problems from the feed yard. Lame cattle, swollen knee joints, uh, livers that are a mess. I mean, there's some nutritionists out there think you can feed 96% concentrates, 4% chopped wheat, horrified what some of these diets are. This is just ridiculous. And then it messes up their livers. Oh, it's not okay. Now here, I made some simple modifications, like I installed a light on the engines of a chute. So it went from 8% mooing, that was due to electric prods having to poke them, to 0% simply by putting a light on a chute entrance. Now meat plants indoors, so putting a light on is probably not gonna work outside, but it works in an indoor facility. Another place I reduced pressure on the net, went from 23% mooing down to zero simply by reducing pressure on the neck. Now this is the data from the original McDonald's lights. And when I first started out my career, I thought I could fix everything with equipment. I could build magic self-managing equipment, uh-uh. In 1996, I collected baseline data for the USDA, and only 30% of the plants could stun 95% correctly on the first shot because the guns were broken. That's management. Then, I got the power of the golden arches behind me, and we started doing the measurement system. And I'm very proud of the fact that out of 75 suppliers, only three had to build something expensive. The rest of them we fixed with non slip flooring, with solid sides in just the right places, and adding lights and changing lights, and moving smaller groups of animals, and getting electric prods out of people's hands. This is the same principle as food safety. You've got to figure out what are the important things to measure. It's not a paperwork audit. It's directly observable stuff. But the trick is, you've got to figure out the five important things to measure. So looking at assessing things like welfare, the trend now is to look at outcome measures. Well, unfortunately now, we're going to, we've got to add to the handling. Lameness on fat beef, swollen joints, Eroded, eroded knee joints inside, dead animals at the feed yard and they shouldn't be dying. These are things I can measure. And what happens is these things can slowly creep up on you. Well, what ran, one rancher did, and he was retaining ownership on cattle, is if one of the animals died in the feedlot, you know, after the receiving period, he got rid of the cow. Because he realized that there was a genetic component there. And then you have some things you just ban, you know, like poking sensitive areas. And getting away from, I'm not telling you what kind of handling facility that you have to have. Working more on the outcomes. Now, let's look at things we need to look at for cattle welfare. The handling scoring. Again, we talked about the sores, lameness. I never would have dreamed 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we'd have lameness issues in fetal and cattle. That's crept up slowly. Dirty animals, skinny animals, ammonia levels in a indoor facility, and when cattle are panting, they're too hot, period, period. They are too hot. That's scientifically verified. Coat condition, that's mainly for organic. Lice in the spring are not okay. Hair falling out in the spring, I'm not talking about shedding, falling all the way out and making bald spots, not okay. Now let's look at lameness. Lameness is a good outcome variable. Just look at all the different things that can cause it. You do a lameness score. Then again, I know something's wrong. 
then it's up to the managers and the veterinarians to figure out what's causing it. Like confirmation, we've got to make sure we do not in cattle repeat the mistakes the pig industry made in the late 80s. They selected just for meat traits, and they got post lighted they got collapsed ankles, and they had 50% of the market hogs in the early 90s that were lame, strictly due to bad leg conformation. That was just blindly selecting for meat genetics. Well, that's a not a nice steer. <coughs> That's two years ago at our Colorado State Fair. That's not something to be proud of. He was in the top 30 of the champions. Mm -hmm. And he's a horrible pig with a disgusting foot. And I've seen some of that on cattle now. He's got a very nice floor there under the pig. But the hoof is absolutely awful. And crooked claw, where the claw twists, they worsen with age, it's a defect. Don't breed that. And then, of course, we got to make sure we don't drag animals. I have a little video called Proper Use of Livestock Driving Tools, like when does tapping become beating? And I uh, used a cardboard box pretty severely. <laughs> and it was a U-Haul box. You can't use an Amazon box. They're too stiff. <laughs> so I made this video before I tried busting up Amazon boxes. <laughs> it was a very stiff cardboard that uh, you can hit a lot harder. <laughs> And then uh, there's a few things where you might have to have some input measures, things like waterers. And let's say we're working on a program to, on animal welfare. The first thing we got to do, make sure you don't do anything that you don't want filmed on this. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot get away from them. They are everywhere. Then work on numerical scoring. Numerical scoring of handling, lameness, and Highly motivated behavior needs. Fortunately, in beef, you don't have to worry about that. That's for the pigs and for the laying hens, where they're in very intensive indoor environments. Outdoor cattle, you just don't have to worry about that. And yes, they do have positive emotions. You see calves running around, jumping all around. Those are definitely positive emotions. And that's my website, Brandon.com. <laughs> and now it's time for questions, which is the part I like the best. So let's get some questions. Okay, right there. I noticed some of your slides uh, uh, involve the word cortisol. What Co is cortisol? Okay, what is cortisol? Okay, cortisol good. is a stress hormone. Yeah. Okay, you get scared, you secrete stress hormone. Yeah. Other things that will go up, your glucose levels will go up, that's your sugar levels, lactic acid will go up. But cortisol is a, a stress hormone. And if you handle animals really roughly and really badly, uh, that cortisol levels will go up. So it's a physiological measure of stress. I'm sorry, I should have explained that. Okay, any other questions? And then we'll go back in the store. We've got a few more books back there. Talk to anybody. Okay, another question right there. Um, uh, something I've noticed is I have autism too. And as I'm watching this, I kind of noticed that isn't there some sort of a link between what autism is like, like walking into blinding areas? Seeing loud things. Is there a link between animals and the way autism? Okay, the question was the link with animals and autism. Well, the thing that helped me a lot of stock is I'm an extreme visual thinker. Mm -hmm. Everything I think about is a picture. You see, now there's different kinds of thinkers in autism. There's the photorealistic visual thinker, and that's shown really accurately in the movie. Like there's a scene in there where a whole bunch of shoes show up. Mm -hmm. And then you have the more, then another kind of thinker is the mathematical mind. These are your computer programmers, your Silicon Valley people, musicians, and then there's a word thinker who knows everything about history or maybe his favorite subject. So there's kind of three different specialized minds. But I am the visual thinker, and we're gonna be good with animals, we're also gonna be good with skilled traits. And one of the things that I'm very concerned about is those visual thinkers are getting screened out with draconian algebra requirements. I absolutely couldn't do algebra. What saved me was in 67, there was a quirk in the educational system where finite math, which was statistics and probability, was sort of a fad at the time. But I'm seeing students in some other states where they're not allowed to take a skill to trade class because they can't pass algebra. Mm -hmm. And we have a gigantic shortage now of skilled trades. Plumbers, electricians, all of the mechanics for like aircraft, cars, and trucks and voters that can read drawings. So I'm talking about the high-end skilled traits. And I know that Texas has put some of this stuff back in, but as I travel around, I'm finding that uh, 
Uh, in the meat industry, for example, the people that build the specialized equipment are all retiring. Mm -hmm. And I went to pork processing plants um, just over a year ago, 2017 in December. Uh, great big, huge, brand new pork processing plants. And I was horrified to observe that we don't make the specialized equipment anymore. And all is coming from French, Canada, and Europe, mm -hmm. because they're doing the skilled trades. We don't have to build a pork processing plant anymore. We built the buildings. Jamison makes a really nice cold room door, clunky things that are expensive to ship. And the reason we're not making these things is the visual thinking kids, the kids that are more like me, are getting screened out. They're playing video games in the basement. You don't need algebra for skilled trades. What you need for skilled trades, and I'm talking about high-end skilled trades, even aircraft mechanics, mm -hmm. is the old-fashioned up through sixth grade. Find the area of a circle, Amen. volume of a tank. Uh, any algebraic equations there are, there's now charts and tables. Believe me, I have those. Yeah. And I'm worried that we're screening out a lot of these really good kids, and they're ending up playing video games in the basement. Mm. And uh, there's some, some of the states, there's some really rigid stuff. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I've learned about careers, students get interested in what they get exposed to. I'm an Easterner originally, and I got exposed to beef cattle when I was 15, when I went and visited my aunt's ranch. Mm -hmm. Students get interested in stuff they get exposed to. And if, if uh, students aren't exposed to fixing cars or welding mm -hmm. or electrical or something like that, they can't get interested in it. And I'm very concerned about the shortage. Also, these are good jobs that are not going to get replaced by computers. Amen. I've been following the AI, artificial intelligence revolution. revolution. What's going to get replaced? High-end doctor jobs like oncology and radiology, don't be bothered. Dermatology, don't be bothered. There's already an iPhone app for that right now. <laughs> Low-level legal stuff will go out. Argentina's already using artificial intelligence for like landlord lease disputes and stuff like that. Low-level accounting. But frontline jobs like a school teacher, nurse, uh, these frontline jobs, yep. you know, a physical therapist for us old people, that's um, not going to be going out. And the high-end skill trades. I'm not talking about roofing or laying floor tiles. I'm talking about the really the things like the electrician, plumbers. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, they're building buildings on our campus. I have talked to the head of the construction company. They can't get enough electricians. Nope. This is a real problem. And I work with a lot of skilled people on my center track restrainer system for the big plants. They were dyslexic. They were ADHD. They probably had autism. So. The guy at 60 now, he had a good job. Maybe owned a metal fabrication company. Mm -hmm. And Junior's playing video games in the basement. Yeah. And as I go back and forth between the autism world and the meat plant world, the cattle world, and even the tech world, I've been to Google, I've been to Microsoft, well, half those programmers are on the spectrum. Yep. You know, it's that, it's that simple. And I'm seeing too many smart kids that are fully verbal get in the handicap mentality. Not learning things like shopping. I talked to a mom last year, and her 16-year-old fully verbal kid had never gone shopping by himself. And when I suggested that he should buy some printer paper, the mom started crying. She said she couldn't let go. They kind of get locked into an autism bubble. And then I go, and I go to Willy Wonka's stainless steel factory. I cannot tell you what Willy Wonka makes, where he's located, because I signed five non-disclosure agreements. <laughs> but I've been in this plane. I've been on his jet. He's in his late 70s now. And we had a half an hour discussion on what he'd be diagnosed with today. ADHD, dyslexia, opposition to defiant, everything mm -hmm. bad he would have been diagnosed. He learned by washing dairy equipment. I had to take it apart to fix it, to clean it. You know, there are still back doors in a lot of these things, and we need to find them. Mm. Mm. I need to just imagine what Willy Wonka is, I can't tell you. <laughs> but I've been in the factory at Stainless Steel Wonderland. And it was built by the Special Ed Department. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! I'm saying that seriously. Okay, let's do a couple more questions, and then we'll go up in there. It's getting hot, and it's right there. Well, one of the best 
saying, the question concern, you know, you know, everyone thinks you got to, but it's the one place where you don't need college. Other jobs you want to do the verbal thinkers, they better go to college. But the one area where you don't need college is what I'm going to call high-end skill trades. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about putting up a plastic board and, uh, and roofing. I'm talking about plumbing, electrical, programmable logic controllers and factories, um, all of the mechanics, marine, I was on a boat the other day for a down at NCAA, a really cute little paddle boat. Somebody's got to fix that thing. And the bigger ships that are out there that have to be fixed, all the mechanics jobs, aircraft mechanic, truck and car mechanic, and uh, welding where you can read blueprints. You've got to be able to read blueprints, make equipment from scratch. These jobs aren't going away, and it's one of the few areas where a college degree is not necessary. Mm -hmm. Other stuff, yeah, it is. But I know people, and I, I actually was at the NCBA trade show touching their stuff. Again, I can't tell you what he makes. But he stutters, he has ADHD, dyslexia, rotten student, took welding, oh, it's a big metal fabrication company. I'm sure you've seen his stuff, but I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> I do have to keep some confidentiality, uh, but this is what really bothers me, because I'm gonna make a point now, at this point in my career, I'm 71 years old now, of going between the autism world, the skilled trades world, the tech world. You got little kids that are mathematicians? Why don't you give them some fractals, give them some geometry, give that third grader some really fun stuff, and it's all free online. Look up quasi-crystalline graphene. <laughs> that is beyond cool. Get some science and nature magazines in your library. What's going on in material science right now? It's a wonderland for the pattern thinker, for the mathematical mind. But a kid's not going to get interested in that stuff unless they are exposed. Yes. And there's a tendency in some schools, they say, okay, well, everybody in the fifth grade needs to do the same math. I'm going, nonsense. I'm not suggesting taking a fourth grader and putting him in high school, but let's get him a high school math book. Cost is not issue. I have looked up these books online. They're $9 and $10 on Amazon. They're laying around in people's attics. You know, just, mm -hmm. you know, find it. This brings up another thing. I spent 25 years in the construction industry. I would sell a job, draw up the drawings, and the way I sold jobs, because I was weird, I'd show off my portfolio. Pictures, drawings, supervisor jobs started up. And in construction, there's an urgency. I talk to a lot of parents about getting their kid this different a job, and they'll say, well, we're just thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I said, in construction, we gotta do it. Now think about it, you gotta do it. Right. And we gotta get better at finding those back doors. The mechanic, I noticed around here, there's a lot of small mechanic shops. And I look at those and I go, each one of those can be a door. You take a kid who's kind of different, you teach him about welding, or teach him about fixing things. Mm -hmm. And he's gonna find out, does he love engines or hate them? But he won't know until he tries it. Mm -hmm. And there's some that I gotta love it. Okay, back there, way in the back. That's John Nelson, he's so talented. Okay, the question is are playing music in a barn. Now, it's a good idea to expose animals to different sounds. Because I went to a very fancy um, racehorse sale called Keeneland. And the, you know, half million dollar horses, million dollar horses at this sale. And when they were showing them down in the stable, they were calm. Then they bring them up to the auction. And nobody had acclimated these animals to the noise of the auctioneer. I started bugging out, tail switching. Another thing they hadn't trained these horses to is to let a strange groom hold you. See, this, this fancy sailor doesn't have a ring fence. It just has a little rope like you might have at the airport to line up. That's all, it, there's no ring. So they have a big, strong groom hold them. And they had never trained these horses to tolerate a strange person holding their lead chain. And when they passed the lead chain over, the horse put its head up and did these giant shrieking whinnies. They never noticed that. You gotta train them. It's okay for strange people to hold you. Get them used to some of the noise. Get them used to some of these different things. And then when they go to the, they're not gonna get all upset. I talked to people that they said, oh, I brought the horse to the racetrack last week, he was fine. And then at the race, he kind of went berserk, but there was crowds there. There was yeah. the noise. You can train them to that. You can get them acclimated to that. Sudden novelty scares. And you suddenly just shove them into something novelty. 
That scares autistic kids too. Okay, right there. What are some of the best things that you can do at home to get your show animals ready to go to the show? Get them, get them to do what now? Your show animals to do what? Get your show animals ready to be around the crowd. Well, you've got to expose them to some of that stuff. Uh, bring all those strange people around, touching them, and just and gradually introduce them. You could take, get some audio recordings of some of the noise, play it softly. You got to make sure it's a high quality audio recording where the high and low frequencies aren't clipped, because that's going to sound different to the animal. Um, but you take it. I noticed that this Keelan sale, there were two things that really scared these horses: the noise of the auctioneer. That would have been easy to do. I could audio record that auctioneer and then play it softly. And the horse absolutely freaked out when all of a sudden a strange person had to hold him and the, and the regular groom just stepped to the side and this horse put his head up like this, shrieking, whinnies. And nobody else notices. I want to half million dollar horses shrieking their heads off. And to fix that, simple. All you have to do at home is get them used to strange people holding you and your regular person steps to the side Teach the horse he doesn't need to freak out over that. See, animals are very specific in their thinking. People think in words, they overgeneralize. And I find that on troubleshooting problems with horses or problems with autistic kids, people overgeneralize. They'll say, what do I do if my horse goes berserk? Well, I don't know, where does he go berserk? I've got to start finding out where it's happening. I saw a horse one time who was terrified of black cowboy hats because during a veterinary procedure, somebody chucked alcohol in his eyes. White cowboy hats were fine, black hats were scary. Another horse was terrified of naked white saddle pants. But when you put a saddle on top, it was fine. <laughs> well, think about it. The pad looks different naked than it does with a saddle on top. You see, it's sensory-based and it's specific. You gotta get away from words. But I noticed, and I watched a bunch of these horses go through this auction, that when the leap chain was passed over to the big, strong groom, most of these, a lot of these horses just put their head back and just shriek. That Winnie was a shriek. He could be easily trained to tolerate strange people holding him. And the Winnie occurred just when the lead chain was switched. So you've got to be observant. Nobody else noticed that. This is the fanciest, most expensive horse sale in the world. We get off the airport, there's 747s out there from the Middle East to take horses back to the Middle East. You know, there's like three gigantic aircraft that take the horses back that they bought there. And they didn't realize they were freaking these animals out at this sale. And it would have been so easy to fix. Mm -hmm. Let's take about, okay, right there. Okay. Well, this is something that's debatable. It's actually, the question was, would it be better to do 24 hours straight through or break it up? Sometimes breaking it up, the stops turn into stress stops. Mm -hmm. Now, this has been found with cattle. The thing you realize about cattle is sometimes loading and unloading is more stressful than the trip. Um, you know, it, it, it might depend. How well is your horse eating and drinking in the trail? That'd be one thing to look at. Is your driving good? One thing that's been learned in the cattle is that bad driving, stomping on the gas, stomping on the brake, greatly, greatly increases stress, increases bruises. Um, that's something that probably needs to be researched, but a lot of it's going to vary on how well the horse is acclimated to the trailer. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to airplanes, I've been on a plane with uh, dairy heifers, they don't do anything when it takes off. They don't have any idea they're going up in the air. <laughs> okay, back there. I'm having trouble hearing of the train or something out there. I'm sorry, I can't hear. I'm really, really sorry. Come up. Maybe somebody else could. Can't catch a horse, okay? There you well, go. I'll tell you one thing. Hiding the hole behind your back doesn't work. He knows he's got it. That's not going to work. Um, well, one of the things that might help is uh, when you catch them, you bring them in and feed them a treat. 
make it worth his while to get caught. That's another thing that may help. But if you, you think you can put the holder on your back, that doesn't work. He knows you got it. He still takes off. Yeah. Um, I need to rope him. <laughs> you know, then they, see, then I don't know the handling history. One of the things where you can have a problem is if you don't know the handling history of an animal. Let's right. say you got the horse from somewhere else. You don't know what somebody did to it. And you can get fear memories that flash back almost like a PTSD. You know, where a soldier hear, uh, hears a certain noise and, you know, he's back in the battlefield. Horses can get kind of a similar effect. That, that's what happened with the black hat horse. White hats were fine, black hats scary. And when I put the hat down on the ground, it was less scary. But then as I moved that hat closer and closer and closer to my head, it got more and more scary. And some of these fear memories can be difficult to deal with. Now, the problem is if you want to show a horse, I can't get rid of all the black hats. No. Naked white saddle hats, I might be able to get rid of. Another common, quite common fear is somebody's abused a horse with a twisted wire jointed bit. Mm -hmm. And then all of the snaffle bits, anything that's jointed, kind of go in a bad department. And if you use a one-piece solid western bridle bit, that's a different, it feels different. So one-piece bits are okay and jointed bits are bad. Now, if you've never been abused with a jointed bit, then jointed bits are gonna be fine. But you see, it's a feeling picture. Okay, right there. Why don't you come up where I can hear you? There's a lot of trucks out on the highway. As you were getting older, you got interested in cattle. But when you were younger, who were you more interested in? When I was younger, you might get my book, Calling All Minds. I was interested in flying kites, making things, model rockets. Mm. So I've got a little book called Calling All Minds. It's got all my childhood aviation experiments, little parachutes I made. One of the things I learned from those projects is I had to tinker with them to get them to work. Mm -hmm. It didn't just work. There are a lot of students today too afraid to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You've got too many students, and it's probably not happening here, but in the cities, we're getting too many students that don't know how to measure with a ruler. They've never done physical things. And they get very frustrated if something doesn't just go perfectly right for them. Thank you. Okay, in the back. Yes, dairy, the question is they're over-selected. Dairy's worse. Mm -hmm. We have been over-selecting for milk production to the point now where they're getting very difficult to breed back. And people are realizing that these super-producing cows have gone overboard on this. We well, need to go back to a smaller cow that might last three or four lactations instead of just two. You see, part of the problem is you keep selecting for more and more milk or more and more meat. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you get in a ton of trouble. But the problem is this trouble creeps up slowly. This is what I call bad becoming normal. People don't realize it. And I kind of compare this to the great cathedral builders. I saw a show, and I think it was like 30 years ago on the Nova Channel about building cathedrals. And they wanted to make them higher and wider. Higher and wider. How high and wide can they make them? And they were doing all this engineering stuff, modeling how the flying buttress system worked. And they spent about 10 or 20 years building this cathedral, the highest and the widest, and it collapsed. They had exceeded the engineering limits of that type of construction. Well, I think a similar sort of thing happened in animals. You keep breeding and breeding for the trade, and you get away with it. And now, all of a sudden, we've got this um, bovine respiratory disease that killed them in that two to three months in the feed yard. That didn't happen before. That's bad becoming normal. And the problem is it creeps up on you. Then you'll realize you gotta back off. Let's look at dogs. Let's bash on pets some. The bulldog. It can't breathe, it can't walk, and it can't have its babies naturally. And if you go back and you look at a picture from 1938, it's called Bulldog's Dilemma. You look it up online, Bulldog's Dilemma. Look it up on Google Images. And you'll see the bulldog in 1938 is a very different dog. Yeah, it actually functioned. But what happened is they have a verbal breed standard. And one of the things it says in the standard is massive head. Well, they didn't know where to stop. It's got such a massive head, it can't birth normally. 
Boy, that's bad becoming Mark. Okay, right here. You're going to have to speak up. Had autism affected working with other people? Did autism affect what, working with animals? Other people. With other kids? Well, I got bullied and teased when I was in high school. And the oh, high school is the worst part of my life. And the only places I was not bullied and teased, we had a good 4-H club, mm -hmm. showing horses, model rockets, and electronics. So where I had friends was where there's a shared interest. Okay, yeah. maybe FFA maybe today, or uh, showing animals, or some other you know, specialized interest. So I'd strongly recommend the kids on the spectrum, it could be computer programming, it could be music, it could be marching band, it could be theater. Mm -hmm. Theater's another great field. That's not gonna get replaced by computers. People are still gonna wanna watch live theater. Now I've been really, following the AI revolution, and I wouldn't bother studying radiology because a computer is going to replace that. Things like finding lung cancers on, ra on radiographs, that'll be done by computers. There's some very high-end knowledge things. People go to school for 10 years for that computers will replace. There's still a lot of programmers that are needed, but a kid's not going to get interested in coding if he's not exposed to it. Mm -hmm. We're not getting kids exposed to stuff they can turn into careers. Okay, let's take about two more questions and we'll go back into the tax store. I've got some books there and I'll just talk to people as long as they want to talk. Okay, right there. Uh, Why don't you stand up so I can hear you? Okay. Which animals have you found hardest to calm down? Hardest to calm down? Yeah. Well, the most hardest to calm down, a lot of this has to do with genetics. Like, if an animal has high-strung, flighty genetics and it gets upset, it gets more upset. Like, I'm not a fan of rough training methods. You know, tie up a steer to something, let them fight it out. You do that to Solaire, probably not going to habituate, probably wreck that animal. He gets more scared. Now, I saw Kurt Pate do a really clever thing on training steers to lay. And uh, what he did, well, he just did it with the last suit, but that requires a lot of skill. Put the holder on your calf and, and put a lead rope extension on it. So you can work with the calf outside the flight zone. You pull on it a little bit to get him to move. When he moves, let up on it. Then you can gradually reduce the flight zone. But the thing that was clever about this is you could start working with training at the lead without being in the flight zone. And I thought that was super clever. I watched Kurt Payton do that last year. Okay, right there. Um, if you have a show animal, like you said that how uh, they, if they see through the panels and stuff, it can distract them and scare them. Uh, what about if it's blind? What about what? If, if you have like a steer that was like blind. Like blind you, animal? Yes, ma'am. Well, you don't. I would try to not approach him on the blind side. A blind animal can get really scared because he'll sense something and he can't see it. And and uh, you don't want to come up on his blind side. Same thing with a horse that's blind. You know, animals like Ron Gill talks about, animals want to see where you're at. And if you surprise him on the blind side, he might lash out and kick you because he just, he can hear that you're there, but he can't see you. All right, one more quick one right there, and then we'll end it. So, uh, <coughs> been, who's autistic? So my, I myself am autistic, and the thing is that I have issues with social interaction. So how do you well, how, issues with social interaction? Well, first of all, you got to learn social interaction like being in a foreign country. And what I'm seeing today is a lot of grandparents coming up to me that had a good career all their life. They'd be an engineer, skilled trade, or accountant. And they find out they're on the autism spectrum and the kids are diagnosed. You see, in our generation, social skills were taught in a much more structured way. You taught to shake hands, taught how to greet people. And it's sort of like training a person uh, how to behave in a foreign country. And I had some good job coaches. Let me tell you what happened at the Swift plant. 1974, I had made my own internship there. And I criticized some welding, and I said it looked like a pigeon had doo-dooed on it. <laughs> That's not the thing I should have been saying. And Harley, the plant engineer, pulled me into his office in private, and he coached me in private that I should apologize for that. 
He also told me that Whitey the welder was his employee, and if I didn't like the welding, I should have come to him. So he told me to chain a command really quietly, right. but also that I should apologize. He coached me on what I should do, and he did not chew me out in front of anybody else. It was in private, talking quietly, and I remember him pulling me into his office, and he said, you need to apologize. Whitey's in the cafeteria right now, and you're going to go up and apologize for that rude talk. And he told me what I should do. You see, and that's the kind of coaching. See, someone on the spectrum has to learn social skills intellectually. It's not instinctual. Yep. In fact, there's a very interesting paper. We'll just end up with this. It's called Genomic Trade-Offs. Autism and Schizophrenia, the high price for a human brain. The same genetic code that gives people a huge brain also causes autism and schizophrenia. Because kind of making the brain big, it's um, kind of a difficult, messy construction. In autism, you get extra circuits in the back, maybe for art, music, or math, and memory, and you shortchange the social circuits. You see, social, being really social, takes up a lot of processor space. Nope, they got geek stuff back here. So we can have electronics that we wouldn't otherwise have. And then in schizophrenia, what happens is the, the network's too skimpy, and then it fails. That's what happens in schizophrenia. So, but it's the same genetic code. There's some really interesting things being learned. The other thing, I'm talking about different kinds of thinkers, mathematical thinkers versus visual thinkers. Take your iPhone or your Samsung phone, whatever you've got. Steve Jobs was an artist. That's why your phone's easy to use. That's industrial design side of engineering. The mathematicians had to make it work so when you swipe it, it would actually work. You see, that's the different minds working together. We do need all the kinds of minds, and I want to thank you all for coming. Amen.